Let's pray together. Father, as always, we want to take a moment and recognize that we are in need of you. God, thank you for the reminder of the truth of the songs that we just sang and the scripture that we just read. And that all could be summed up with you are great, we are not. And so God, we need you to help us to open our eyes to see and to know the truth. Particularly this time of year as we are approaching Easter, God, I pray that you would remind us how not only our entire faith hangs upon what happened, but God, I pray that you would remind us that the story of Easter is the story of you coming to help us, the story of you coming and doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. And so God, we thank you for that. And as we open your word now, we ask you to help us to see it, to know it, to love it. I ask you to help me, God, to communicate it in a way that honors you and is helpful to us. God, we thank you for this time. We ask you to bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you got a Bible, we're in John chapter 19. We've been in it for a couple weeks, and we'll be in it this week and next week as we approach Easter. And as I've told you a couple times, this is the chapter where John gives us the details of Jesus going to the cross. Now, we have four accounts of this called the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what's called the synoptic Gospels, which means there's a lot of uh, things that are synonymous between them, and John's kind of stands on its own, not because it was in somehow, you know, like they're right and he's wrong, but John just gives some different perspectives on the events of Jesus's life, and not that they're any less historical, but he's going to point out some things that the other Gospels don't, and that's what makes it different. And we're going to see that again today in John chapter 19. There's some things that John points out that are quite striking, and as I've said for the last several weeks, have huge theological significance for our faith, and I, and I hope to show you those again. So we're going to go John chapter 19, verses 16 through 27, and this week is when Jesus actually goes to the cross, when he's actually, uh, they actually start the process of crucifying him, and then next week we'll see that finish. So let's go John chapter 19, I'm going to read verses 16 through 22 first, and then we'll stop and talk about it, all right? It says, so they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Now that's significant, I'll come back to that. Verse 19, it says, Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city gate, also significant, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek, just so they hit everybody, so they can read it. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews, even though he never said that. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Deal with it. That's my addition into it, all right? And so this is the time where Jesus actually goes to the cross. Now, some of the other gospels, like I said, point out some other differences, like Jesus, they actually had someone else carry uh, the cross with Jesus part of that time. John doesn't point that out. And again, that doesn't mean that they don't have cohesion between the two. That just means they're pointing out different details for different reasons, but there are some things that John points out here that are significant. Two things in this set of scriptures. First, the place, and then the purpose. The place, John tells us, that he goes to is called the place of the skull. Or in Aramaic, it's Golgotha. Now, in Latin, it is Calvary which means skull. So if you ever wonder why we call it Calvary, why we call it Golgotha, they're the same place, just different languages, all right? Typically, 
we would refer to as Calvary because our language is more based on Latin than it is on Aramaic. So Calvary is a very common term. In fact, in Greek, it would be the word for cranium or skull. And so this place that John gives us some details about where it is and what it was called. But there is some debate on exactly where this is, where exactly Jesus was crucified. Now, in Christian history, there's two primary places that this is. And I'm gonna tell you about those two places and then tell you why I don't think it's either one of those places. Not that I'm the smartest, but I'll just tell you why. First, in the most historical place or the one throughout church history that is believed to be the place that he was crucified and buried was where now sits the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, which I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, but give me some grace, all right? But this is where Constantine, which if you know anything about world history, in particular Roman history or even church history, Rome was not Christian during Jesus' day, obviously, and even in the first several hundred years of the apostles and the early church, it was not Christian. But Constantine, who was the Roman emperor in the fourth century, in the 300s, became a Christian. And when he did, he baptized the entire Roman Empire, which was the known world at that time. So like overnight, the entire world became a Christian, which I'll let you decide if they were actually Christian or not. And here's what's crazy, very similar to the United States. At that point in time, to be Roman was to be Christian. People were like, are you Christian? They were like, yeah, I'm Roman, which is very similar to America. Not, maybe not today, but you know, 30, 40 years ago, people were like, are you Christian? You're like, yeah, I'm American. Yeah. Will you go to church? Yeah, I live in America, right? It's kind of like that idea. They're synonymous with one another. And what happened during that time, Roman, uh, Roman Constantine's mother, now being Christian, wanted to go around and identify all these sites in the Bible that we had read about, that they had known about, had been passed down. Of course, they didn't have the completed Bible yet. And so she starts going around and finding out, here's a place, here's a place, here's a place, here's a place. And some of them are correct. In fact, if you ever go to Israel, we, not we, I say we like I'm a part of them, but this is how they do it. They say they have A sites, B sites, C sites. A sites are like, we know for sure. Just like you get grades in school, right? B sites are like, ah, oh, we think so. C sites are like, probably not. Well, the site of the crucifixion is, again, none of these are, or none of these two are A sites. And the Church of the Holy Sepulchre would be on the kind of the southwest part from the temple. And it is literally the word sepulcher means like a, 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 rock, a hole in a rock. And during the time of Jesus, more than likely, or even the time of Constantine, sorry, this was the temple to Venus, one of the Roman gods, which I told you last week is where we named all of our planets off of. And so there's this place where she said that that's where it happened. So they built a church over it, and it has been there. Now, you know, kind of changed hands over the years. But if you go there today, there is a Catholic church that is there, very ornate. And then down below it is supposedly where Jesus was crucified and buried. Personally, I don't think that's the site because geographically it doesn't make sense. And then two, during that time, it was not a place that would have been considered a place of the skull. Now, in the 1800s, I think 1800s, maybe early 1900s, I can't remember exactly, there was a second place that was found. So from 400s, you know, fourth century to the 19th century, everybody thought that's where it was. Well, then in the 1900s, a guy goes to Jerusalem and he's, you know, doing some excavation, looking at things, and they find the place now that's called the Garden Tomb. Because in this rock cliff, kind of this rock face, is a picture that looks like a skull. And if you look it up, you can see it. It, had, it kind of has like places into the rock enclave that look like eyes and a nose. And interestingly enough, it does sit right outside a bus depot, a Muslim bus depot. And the Muslims know that this is where Christians think Jesus was crucified. So they throw trash over the fence all the time at it just to desecrate it. And right beside that is a tomb. 
In fact, if you were to look it up, it is a representation of what tombs would have been like, a very expensive one, because it has a stone, a, a, a circular stone that was rolled away. So at that point in time, people were like, this is it. There is the place of the skull. There is the tomb. Now, when you go there and you see the empty tomb, and again, I'm not saying it's not the place, but, but you do get this sense of, of what it would have been like for Jesus to actually have gotten out of that thing. Because they would have rolled the tomb over, chained it up, like you ain't coming out. Mostly because dead people don't come out. But two, how are you gonna roll that out from the inside? One of the problems with that tomb though, is we know now the chains on the outside of it were from the Iron Age, which were about 500 years before Christ, which the Bible tells us this tomb was a new tomb that Jesus was laid in. So more than likely, that's not the tomb. And we don't know for sure that if the rock face 2,000 years ago still looked like a skull. We don't know that. So those two places could be it, but I'm gonna submit a third to you. Personally, what I think is it was actually on the Mount of Olives which if you look at the Temple Mount, was to the east. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, southwest, Garden Tomb, northwest, and could have still been inside the city. But to the east, that was outside the gate. To the east on the Mount of Olives is very significant, which I'll come back to you later and tell you why I think that is. But before we get to that, let me point out another thing that John says here, which gets to the purpose. John says that Jesus was crucified between two people. So you got Jesus, two people. How many is that? Come on. That was an easy one, man. <laughs> Jasper, I know you got it. All right. This two plus one is See, you're so smart. I knew you had it. I, I, I knew you, I was caught you off guard. All right, so I knew you could. I knew you could get it. So there was three. You got one on either side. You got Jesus in the middle. What's interesting about that is not just. And John doesn't tell us about the conversation that happens with those on the other two crosses. The other gospels do that, and there's huge theological implications that come from that as well. One where Jesus turns to the guy and says, today you'll be in, in paradise with me, which is why I don't think Jesus actually went down into hell after he died. I think he went to heaven because the cross was hell. The cross was the place of God's judgment, which is one reason why I think it was on the Mount of Olives because in between the temple and the Mount of Olives was the Valley of Jehoshaphat or the Kidron Valley, which means the place of judgment. So Jesus was judged on the cross, but what's significant that John points out here is that he was judged, he was crucified between two other people. And theologians throughout the years have picked up on that fact and used it as a way to illustrate how the gospel is different than the two other primary ways in which people live, which still lead to death. In fact, one of the early church fathers, Tertullian, said this, and I've got his quote here on the screen. It says, just as Christ was crucified between two thieves, so this doctrine of justification is ever crucified between two opposite errors. Between two opposite errors. Little did I know the phrase that I heard that I use all the time on either side of the road is a what? Ditch. I didn't know that Tertullian had been saying that thousands of years ago. On the other side of the road is a ditch, which I use that because one of my religion professors said that when I was in college, and it just is a great example of how there's actually two ways to be wrong. You can go off on the ditch this way, or you can go off on the ditch this way, which I've pointed out, which means for every mile of truth, there's two miles of lies. You with me when I say that? So there's two ways to be wrong, and they both lead to death. And the gospel is neither one of those ways. Let me point out what Tertullian was talking about. He says this doctrine of justification, the doctrine of justification is how we are justified 
before God, how we are made right. We might say how we are saved. Well, one way that people think that they are saved, which is the cross on the one side, is the way of keeping the law. This is probably what is most prevalent, especially, used to be in America, but especially in the American South, which is where we find ourselves. This is the idea that, oh, I'm a good person. Now our whole idea of good is very, very flawed because we compare ourselves to historical figures like Hitler. Well, like I'm not Hitler, as if that's how God judges on the curve. Hitler, Hitler, not Hitler, not Hitler. No. Which is why people say, I understand Hitler going to hell, but my grandma? Listen, I don't know about y'all's grandmas, but we might think of sweet old ladies and forget that they were once teenagers. And we know, ain't no teenager good. <laughs> that was a joke, I got teenagers, all right. But, but what I'm talking about is this side of the cross is I am made right before God if I keep the law. If I keep the law. And this is what's the hardest for people particularly who grow up in church. If you grow up in church, you are told the rules, you got good parents, and they're trying to help you have a good and fruitful life, which I'm not saying that, you know, keeping the law is a bad way to do that. No, I'm, I'm saying that's a good way. There are laws we should obey them. But here's where we have to be careful. Our obedience to the law doesn't justify us before God. That's the wrestle. And so you might think of this ditch as legalism. But you have to ask the question, how good? Or compared to who? Because see, if we compare ourselves to Hitler, we're winning. But if we compare ourselves to Christ, you think we're winning? No, we losing. But that's the standard. And so there's a whole host of us who grew up in church, these are the people who don't go to church except for Christmas and Easter, and then when you have to do their funeral, you have to say, well, they, people say they were a good person. And I know you've been alive probably long enough that you've experienced those things. People are like, I don't know if they were saved or not. Because it's this twisted idea that keeping the law is actually what makes me right or justified. But then on the other side of Jesus... On the other cross, the opposite error is the exact opposite of that. Where if keeping the law is like a sacred idea, then on the other side, you have a secular idea, which is breaking the law. Breaking the law. In fact, this is what modern culture says. In fact, pretty much every culture says Freedom is not found, justification is not found, fulfillment is not found in keeping the law. Freedom and justification and joy and happiness is found you being your own law. This is what Pilate said to Jesus a couple weeks ago, and he says, what is truth? Well, if it's true for you, it's true for me, whatever. What's good for you, it's good for you, what's good for me, it's good for me. So over here, you might think this is, if, this, if the law is like a sacred thing, this is like a secular thing. Freedom is found by breaking the law. And here's what's crazy. The devil doesn't care which ditch you get in, as long as you get in one. And this is where we gotta be careful. Because we can look at people who break the law and think, oh yeah, they are sinners. But we can look at people who try to keep the law and like, well, no, they're good people. Both are dead ways of life. Death wins in both of those instances. And here's what I'm trying to show you. The gospel is neither one of those. The gospel is in the middle. And the gospel is not halfway in the sense of like, it's a little bit of this and it's a little bit of this. No. See, there's another way we can think about this. On this side of the law, we might think of truth. And on this side of breaking the law, we might think of grace. But see, Jesus was full of truth and full of grace. That's what John said. Like this is what Jesus said. John just said what Jesus said. 
So the gospel is not half of these two things, it's the fulfillment of these two things in the sense where we couldn't keep the law, so Jesus kept it for us, and those who break the law now get grace because he kept it. See, the gospel is a third way. The gospel is a different way. And here's the essence of the gospel. You were so bad because you broke the law, but you were so loved that Jesus kept the law and gave you his record. See, what we have to understand is the gospel is neither one of those things. We are not justified by keeping the law. We're not justified if we break the law. We're justified when we have faith in the one who kept the law but gave us his grace for those who broke the law. Does that make sense? Now let's keep going. Back to John 19. It says, when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garment. He's not dead yet. Remember, crucified means they just put him on the cross. They took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing, they cast lots. Remember I told you last week, God is sovereign over all of this, and Acts told us that this was all predestined to take place. Here's what I'd just like to point out to you. God is so sovereign about this, he knew exactly what was gonna happen to Jesus' clothing, and even prophesied it hundreds of years beforehand. God is into the details, y'all. But there's something that, that John points out here that I'm like, John, why did you do this? First, I want you to understand that when it says they took Jesus' garments, more than likely they means they took them all. So Jesus more than likely was naked on the cross. Now, we don't see that in very many crucifix and paintings because that would just be weird, right? Churches don't got that one hanging out in their lobby. They normally have a cloth over Jesus, which is fine. I'm not saying that we should have naked pictures of Jesus hanging on a cross. But what I'm saying is, more than likely, he had nothing on. He was completely exposed, made bare in front of God in the world. And these pieces of clothing that they took off. One, it says his garments, which more than likely would have been his undergarments. It says they took those, divided them up, which is super weird to me. But second, John says, but his tunic. But his tunic, now that would have been the outer garment more than likely. So the other one's inner garments, just think. I mean, underwear, you know, undershirt, that kind of stuff. But the tunic would have been the outer one. That was the one that you would have seen. And if you've seen Chosen or any other movies, if you, you see them walking around, it's almost like they have this, like one long piece of clothing. We don't really have clothing like this a lot today. Although sometimes, I never know where fashion is going, by the way. People are like, you're fashionable. I, don't, I just stay where I'm at, and then about every 15 years, I come back in style. <laughs> it's funny to me. Because it, it's cyclical, right? I, it, but it's almost like this thing is like a poncho. It, it's one seamless thing from top to bottom. And I look at that, and I think, John, with everything going on here, why are you telling us about his tunic? Do we really need to know it was seamless? Woven together from top to bottom? Do we really need to know that? Well, one reason we need to know that, I've already pointed out, is because the prophets prophesied what would happen to Jesus' clothing. They cast lots for them. So that happened. And this is where you're like, well, if God prophesied it and the Romans did it, then who did it? Yes. Was it God or the Romans? Yes. 
They freely chose it, but God prophesied it. But I think there's a deeper reference here to what's going on, to the fact that John is telling us Jesus' tunic was seamless. Let me give you the definition of seamless. I have it here on the screen. The first one is just going to amaze you. Having no seams. I know, right? You're like, whew, I didn't know that. I didn't know that seamless meant having no seams. Yes. But there's some deeper definitions I want to get into. Listen to this. Smoothly continuous or uniform in quality. I love these. Having no awkward transitions, interruptions, or indications of disparity. See, when something is seamless, what that means is, you know, there was two pieces of fabric that came together, and they put it together in a way where there was no awkward transitions. You can also think about this when they put carpet down in your house. You know, they're putting pieces together, and they seam it, and at the top, you can't even tell there's a seam there. There's no awkward transitions. And then I started thinking about this idea of how we use the word seamless, right? We use the word seamless to describe transitions. You know, I mention politics quite often in sermons because I'm always trying to get us to understand that political people aren't our saviors. But one of the best ways we understand seamlessness in American life is between one presidential uh, administration to the next, right? We call it the transfer of power. And the idea is there's a seamless transition between the two. And then we think about it in our own stages of development in life, how we transition from a, a baby to walking to a young child to a teenager. And that's when I started thinking, talk about awkward transitions. I, I, I was talking about teenagers. Earlier. Remember back, if, if you're not a teenager, remember back on your transitions in life? Speaking about awkwardness. Let me just say it like this. My transitions from a child to teenager to adult, adult were not seamless. They were quite awkward at times. You know, there was times where my feet stunk so bad that people couldn't even be in the room with me. That's an awkward transition. Times where, you know, you start getting hormones and it starts showing up on your face. That's, a, that's an awkward transition. I remember Jackson, when he had his baby teeth going to his adult teeth, talk about another one. Isn't God so good that he gives you a do-over on your teeth? Because he knows you ain't going to brush it, and he knows you're going to eat a lot of nerds, right? For me growing up, it was mambas. Mambas in the house, all right? I mean, I would literally find change in our couch and go to our corner store and buy those jokers. I loved them. And when you go from baby teeth to adult teeth, sometimes you can have some awkward transitions. I'll never forget Jackson, our son. When he was younger, when he still had his baby teeth, he was walking into a friend's house and he tripped and he hit the bottom of his chin on the, like the door frame. And I mean, really, he got a scar, cracked it open, right? And later, as he was going into his adult teeth, one of his teeth at the top was not, the baby tooth was not coming down. It was not coming out. We were waiting on it because he needed to get braces. And then they did an x-ray to see. And what had happened was the adult tooth was ready to come in. It was there. But since the baby tooth hadn't dropped, his body made a second adult tooth. He had two tooths. We call those teeth, right? Up there. And literally they had to go in, remove the baby tooth, cut out the other one, put a chain on that and bring it down. Talk about an awkward transition. We've told Jackson many times that he has a lot to thank us for and his smile is one of them. Because we paid for that joker, right? That is not a seamless transition. So I, I want you to get this idea of John talking about Jesus' tunic and how it was seamless. There was no awkward transitions in it. There were no interruptions, no indications of disparity. Disparity means differences. 
And I want you to think deeper than just Jesus's tunic. Think about it like this. One, the tunic was on the outside. And that's what Jesus projected to the world. So when people saw Jesus, what they saw was seamlessness. What they saw in this tunic was a seamlessness. No awkward transitions, no disparity, smooth. You could say it like this, perfect. And the thing about Jesus that stands out between any other people that have ever lived is there was a seamlessness to Jesus. There was a perfection to Jesus. There was no awkwardness in him. And Jesus on the cross being fully exposed for who he was, was projecting to the world perfection, was projecting to the world he's completely seamless. He's completely perfect. But I think there's some deeper theological things going on here too. And one has to do with the fact of exactly where Jesus was crucified. Where I told you earlier, I think it is on the mountain of Olives. You see, there's some huge significance to the Mount of Olives. It was on the eastern side of the temple. In fact, if you go there today, you can still see it. The Garden of Gethsemane is at the bottom, and then there's a, 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 a mount, and then you go over that, and then you go to Bethany. Well, that's the way that Jesus came into the temple, into the eastern gate. And then he went back out there, and that's where he was arrested. And there was a Roman law at that time that your crucifixion needed to happen pretty close, or your punishment needed to happen pretty close to the place of your crime. So Roman law would dictate Jesus would need to be crucified on that side. The other thing is, it's huge theological significance, the Mount of Olives. The Bible says repeatedly that the Messiah would come from the east. And so Jesus went into the temple that way. It makes sense they would take him back out that way and crucify him. It also is the place where Jesus ascended. And it is also the place, according to the prophet Zechariah, that he will return. So there's huge theological significance to the Mount of Olives. Huge. But there's more. See, on the Mount of Olives is where you could look back to the temple and you could see the Holy of Holies. You could see the temple mount. And so what I want you to get this picture of, here's Jesus on one side, here is the temple on the other side. And you say, what's the deal about that? Let me show you this in Matthew. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 50 and 51, it says, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. This is when he actually died. We'll get into that next week in John. But look at verse 51. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Now listen to this phrase. From top to bottom. The curtain of the temple was torn in two. From top to bottom. Signifying that the curtain itself was seamless. It was seamless, but it was torn in two from top to bottom. Remember John saying his tunic was seamless, woven from top to bottom. Look at this. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. See, this is the moment where Jesus died. And here's what I want you to see. In fact, I've got a picture of it here on the screen. This is why I think Jesus was crucified on the Mount of Olives. This is from the Mount of Olives, from the viewpoint looking behind Jesus, and you see across the valley the Holy of Holies. So Jesus on the cross on one side would have been looking at the Holy of Holies. And if you know anything about the temple, what separated the holy place to the most holy place was a seamless curtain that served as a barrier from keeping the sinful people out from the holy place. And on this side of the hill was also a seamless curtain. 
Jesus. And he was woven together from top to bottom. He was perfect from head to toe. And I want you to see this. At the moment that Jesus gave up his spirit, this power goes out and it goes out directly across the valley of judgment to the Holy of Holies. And what you had on the Holy of Holies was a curtain that was 80 feet tall. And at that moment, See, this was the place where you had to go inside and put the blood on the altar for the sacrifices of sin. And at that moment, when Jesus died, the Bible says this thing split from top to bottom. And here's what I want you to see. It's like, grab, it's like God grabbed that curtain with his hands and did this. Why? Why? Because what was seamless was torn in two. It was torn in two. See, I think John points out that his tunic was seamless because his tunic pointed to a greater reality. Jesus was seamless. And he was woven together from top to bottom. He was perfect. He was seamless. But when he came and when he died... He was torn into. So now that a holy God could be with his people. And here's what I want you to see. Remember, seamless means no awkward transitions. You want to know why I think God tore the temple curtain in two? Because he was showing there was now a seamless transition from the old covenant to the new. There was now a seamless transition from the blood sacrifices that had to be given once a year to now once for all time. See, if you go read the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is laying all this out for you. In fact, in Hebrews 9, it says he was crucified outside the gate. And John 19 tells us it was outside the gate. What gate? There's only one gate, biblically speaking, that the Old Testament refers to like that. It's the Eastern one. So the reason why I don't think it's the church of the Holy Sepulchre or the Garden Tomb, because that's on the west side of the temple. This is on the east side. And so Jesus was crucified on the east side to show that the valley of judgment had been dealt with, and now there's a bridge that gets us back to God. And it's Jesus. And now there's a seamless transition between what Jeremiah called the old covenant to the new covenant, which now sets the stage. Watch this. This is what's so amazing for another seamless transition from earth to heaven. See, why was the temple curtain torn from top to bottom? Because it signifies the top heaven came down to the bottom. God came down to earth. And what's going to happen when Jesus ascends? He goes back to the top. Why? God came from heaven to earth so that we who are of the earth could get to heaven. And the next seamless transition that Jesus talks about is those who die in his name will not die. See, if you're in Christ, if you've trusted Christ, you will have a seamless transition now from the bottom to the top. Because the top came to the bottom, the curtain was torn from the top to the bottom so that those that are in the bottom could now get to the top if they're in Christ. And so the seamless transition that's coming for us, the Bible says, even though you die, you don't die. People are like, what does that mean? I wanna tell people, I don't know, I hadn't experienced it yet. But here's what I know. At the moment of death, God saves us from death. At the moment of our last breath, we, if we are in Christ, we make a seamless transition into the presence of God. Why? See, Jesus said, tear this temple down and I'll rebuild it in three days. And the Jewish people, so factual, said, 
took care of 46 years. How are you going to do it in three days? Because Jesus wasn't talking about an earthly temple. He was talking about his body as a temple. Seamless transition. And now the presence of God did not dwell in a holy place. The presence of God dwells in holy people who have been made holy by the sacrificial lamb. Do you see it? There's been a seamless transition that has taken place from the old to the new. And if you're in Christ, one day you'll make a seamless transition from death to life. But if you're not in Christ, you'll make an awkward transition. Because you won't go from the bottom to the top, you'll go from the bottom to the bottom. See, Matthew says that when this happened, the earth shook and the rocks were split. What's crazy, if you keep reading in Matthew and just didn't have time, it says that dead people in tombs came out. Which another reason why I think the crucifixion happened on the Mount of Olives because you know what is also on the Mount of Olives and they're still there to this day? Tombs. There's graves all over the Mount of Olives. Thousands and thousands of them. So it would make total sense that Jesus was crucified on that side and it would make total sense there was a new grave over that side that Jesus just needed to borrow for a couple days. And also church history tells us Mary, his mother, wanted to be buried at the place he was buried. Any guesses on where she was buried? Mount of Olives. And speaking of Mary, let's go back to John. John 19, verse 24 through 27. Look at what Jesus does. So, so the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Three Marys, y'all. Mary and her sister Mary. <laughs> now listen, I'm a fan of the name Mary. My, sister, my sister's name is Mary. My aunt's name, my dad's sister is Mary. So I'm a fan of Mary's, but that had to be confusing. Mary? Maybe they just did it for ease because they wanted them both to come. I don't know. But then there was also Mary Magdalene. Now, verse 26, look at this. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, that's John, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. Now listen to this phrase. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. Now, what's going on here, I think, on a basic level, this is Jesus taking care of his mama. Which you can tell a lot about a man about how he takes care of his mama, right? I'm unashamedly a mama's boy. I don't care what you think. My dad's my hero, but I'm a mama's boy. I'm gonna take care of my mama. Now, she went to be with Jesus 10 years ago. But I can't imagine at this moment, Jesus turns to his mother, and on one hand, he's telling John, take care of her. But on another hand, I want you to see this. The power of the gospel is so powerful that it shook the earth. It split the rocks and dead people came out of graves. In fact, if you keep reading in Matthew, the, the Roman soldiers, after they see all this, they said, surely he's the son of God. You would too if you would have seen all that. But here's what I want you to see. The gospel of Jesus is so powerful that it shakes up everything, even your relationships, even your family dynamics. This is why Paul later in Timothy tells Timothy, if a, if a man doesn't take care of his family, he's worse than an unbeliever. But on a deeper level, what the gospel does is it makes us all family. Do you see that? See, at one point in time, someone said to Jesus, your mother's here, and Jesus goes, who's my mother? And don't you know the disciples were like, one of the Marys. <laughs> but Jesus was saying, no, 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 no. And this is where I think the Catholic Church gets it wrong. They venerate Mary. They pray to Mary. 
And I think Mary would say, you don't understand. Don't pray to me. I'm not anybody. Because the family dynamic changed after this. And again, we should take care of our biological family. Yes, we should take care of our mothers, our sisters, our brothers, our daughters. Our, yes, but what I want you to see is the broader implication of the gospel is now we're all family if we're in Christ. We are brothers and sisters, one to another. And Jesus looks at John and says, John, you're now responsible to care for her. And it says he took her into his home for the rest of her life. John took care of Jesus's mother as if she was his own mother because the power of, gospel, of the gospel had so shook up his life and split his heart open where he came out of a grave and now he's alive and he sees everybody as his mother. He sees everybody as his family. That's what made the church explode. Do you know that? What made the church explode is how they loved one another. Isn't that what Jesus said, how people would identify his disciples? And so here's the only thing I can conclude. If we got a church full of people not loving one another, the only thing I can conclude is the power of the gospel hasn't shook them enough yet. The power of the gospel hasn't split open their heart enough yet. And I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm just saying they're walking around like zombies as though they're still dead. Now, I don't believe in zombies, but I do believe in Christians who walk like around them. Do you see that the gospel, and here's what I want you to see. You say, why, what happens? Because you wanna know what happens? Even after we're saved, we still drift back into one of those ditches. We drift back over into the ditch of legalism where we think we have to obey in order to be loved. Or our flesh drifts back over into this ditch and says, I don't want God telling me what to do with my life. But if you stay right here, and here's what's crazy. Jesus told his mother, behold your son. And don't you think Mary thought, I am. I'm looking at you. And imagine what that was like for Mary. The man that she believed was God, but she still gave birth to him. She still felt him in her womb. She felt him move. She gave birth to him in Bethlehem, which by the way is where the sacrificial lambs were raised. Next week, we're gonna see that Jesus' side was pierced, but don't you know Mary's was pierced too? And, and I think what Jesus tells Mary is so significant because here's the key. Here's the key to having the power of the gospel shake your life and split you open. You keep beholding the son. You keep beholding the son. You keep looking at him. You never get over that he saved you. You never get over that he sacrificed his life for you. You never get over that he was pierced for you. You never get over that the crown of thorns he bore were your thorns that you brought forth. You never get over that he was the seamless one, the perfect one who split open the difference between heaven and earth so that you could walk in to the presence of God. See, when you behold that, the only response that you can have is to love others the way you love yourself because you were bought with a price by the precious blood of Christ. Behold the son the seamless one. And here's what's crazy. If you do, you won't have any more awkward transitions. Let me leave you this. For a lot of us as Christians, we have an awkward transition between Sunday and Monday. Between who we are inside these walls and who we are outside these walls. There's an awkward transition. But if you're in Christ and you keep beholding the sun, they'll turn seamless 
and you'll be the same. You'll have integrity no matter where you go. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gospel. It is unlike anything else. No other religion on the face of the planet has at the center of their justification God who is at the top coming down to the bottom for the veil being torn from top to bottom so that those that in the, are in the bottom that are in death can now have life, can be raised again. God, I pray that this Easter season, we would behold the sun. We would see the son who when he was on that cross, he saw the Holy of Holies. He was looking at the place where animals were sacrificed, knowing that he was substituting himself as the sacrifice. And now by his blood, we can be justified with you. God, I pray anybody here today or listening who is not trusted in Jesus today would trust in the power of the gospel. Who God, who knew no sin, became sin so that they might become the righteousness of God in Christ. No one looking around or talking here as we close. If there's never been a point in time in your life where you've beheld the son like that, where you looked at him and you realized that on the cross, he poured out his life for you. And his body was torn from top to bottom for you. And if today you want to trust in him, then you can believe and you can confess. And you can do that with me. You don't have to pray this out loud. But if you want to trust Christ, pray this with me. Say, Father, thank you for loving me. That you sent Jesus in my place for my sin the seamless one for the sinful one. I believe that Jesus paid for it on the cross and that he rose again and that in him I'll rise again. So make me alive. Forgive me. Thank you for loving me. Now, if you're here in one of our locations, Canton and Jasper, and you just prayed that with me, Would you just simply lift up your hand so we can see that? We got men and women gonna walk around, put a gift in your hand, and when they do, you can put it down. Thank you. In just a moment, you'll have an opportunity to give us your information. If you're watching online, you can fill out the digital connection card. Let us know that you trusted Christ. But then those of us who have trusted Christ, I pray this Easter season in my own life as well, we would continue to behold the sun. We would stare at his seamlessness, his integrity, his holiness, his wholeness until he changed us from one degree of glory to another and made us seamless, made us perfect, made us one with integrity. We were the same everywhere. We loved our neighbor as ourself. We treated everyone as though they were our family. God, thank you for this. Not only for the power of the gospel to raise us from the dead, but the power of the gospel to continue to transform us to be holy like Christ, to have seamless lives where we are woven together from top to bottom. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.